traditional witches do not necessarily need to embrace traditional values. I know that I might be poking some folks right in the eye with this topic, but I feel like it's worth talking about and it's important to talk about. Are you ready to have some witchy assumptions challenged? Then I hope you'll stick with me as we talk about how there are some traditional gender norms, sexism, and homophobia that are baked in to a lot of the ceremonial forms of witchcraft and how it's high time we rewrite the recipe. Lorelai Black here from Blade and Broom, the witchy aunt you wish you had, <laughs> and I'm willing to be that, here in the secret garden cottage where we gab about witchcraft, especially traditional witchcraft, and, and get up to shenanigans and, and drink things in teacups. So I hope you brought yours because I brought mine. If you knew... Uh, if you're new here and you like what you're finding, please subscribe and click the bell for notifications. It really helps us out. And if you're returning, thank you so much. Welcome back. The channel has a Patreon uh, to help support the goings on here. And fun stuff is happening over there. The link is down below in the description box for this video, along with links to any of the resources that get mentioned today and my link tree where you can find other witchy shenanigans that I'm getting up to. It's time to dive in. So first off, happy birthday to the channel. Yay! Oh. Happy birthday to the channel. Happy birthday to the channel. Happy birthday. Okay. It's warm in here today, so I'm going to drink some celebratory ginger ale. So we're one year old, and since our birthday is the kickoff of Pride Month, um, I thought this was a good time for us to get into this topic that's kind of been on my mind for a while. So what we're going to be looking at is how gendered magic, specifically, and certain traditional values don't necessarily fit within traditional witchcraft, witchcraft at large, or I would even go so far as to say mm, contemporary magic, that it's time we rethink how we think about gender and magic. I can tell that some of y'all are real uncomfortable with this, uh, and that it's making you real nervous and you don't like what I have to say. It's time we talk about this, we need to. And I um, know that some of you out there are like, hooray, somebody's finally addressing this. I've always wondered about why I saw the things I saw or why things are the way that they are in this one thing. So I'm going to say, like right off, I'm probably not going to hit everything that needs to be covered in this because we would be here for hours and we would need like a panel of people and, and I, and I didn't do that. Like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get a panel of people together. I could probably, like I know some people, anyway, this topic is more deep than I'm even going to go into here. I just want to get the ball rolling on the conversation. We're going to like put this out there and let it percolate for those that need a little bit of time to adjust to some ideas. And some of what we're going to talk about is really going to deeply challenge the way you have viewed and practiced magic. I feel like it's a safe thing for us to say that we can all agree that homophobia is bad and that traditional gender roles are passe and outdated. If we can't agree on these things, I'm not sure exactly what you like about my channel. <laughs> Those are values that I uh, definitely ascribe to. Just saying. I hope we can all agree on that. Most folks that ascribe to a witchy worldview embrace values that include inclusivity, accessibility and equality. Honestly guys, I say most, but I have to admit that when I first came in touch with witchcraft and traditional witchcraft back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of open homophobia and sexism that was embraced and taught by 
the leadership and the eldership. It was in the books. It was in the classes that you went to. And it was surprising. And it was off-putting. And it was upsetting. And everybody mostly said, but that's how magic is. So it's okay that we have these views. You can practice in your personal life whatever you want. You know, you can be how you are. You can be who you are. But magic doesn't work that way. Magic works this way. So therefore, our rituals have to be this way. And we're going to talk about, for instance, the elements this way. And we're going we're gonna to do things like this because that's natural. And I think today that those ideas still exist. That those ideas are still fundamentally part of how magic is practiced because they're baked in, because they're foundational to so much of, um, of what's taught about magic within Western traditions. So tell me if this sounds familiar. Only a woman can invoke a goddess. Only a man can invoke a god. There's just not room in your body for those other parts. Or only a man and a woman together can perform the great rite. Or, and I know that you've heard or read this one, because again, it's kind of foundational to Western magic. Feminine energy is receptive and passive. Earth and water are feminine energies. Masculine energy is projective and active. Fire and air are masculine energy. I'm going to tell you, all of that is equally crap. It's an outdated way of viewing both spirit and energy, and it needs to be rooted out. <laughs> I've pissed some of you off <laughs> now. I know I have. Stick with me to hear why I think that these don't work and where they come from. So these really basic ideas are rooted in some very old, very hermetic, very platonic, like based in Plato's concepts, but the way that middle Platonists and neoplatonists ended up sort of evolving the ideas based in that school of thought, based in those philosophies. I have some links for you below for you to explore neoplatonism and um, hermeticism to get a little bit more of an idea about what I'm talking about if those are new concepts for you. So some of this thought is actually rooted further back in the duality of Zoroastrianism, uh, which is the world's original sort of black and white mindset or worldview. Everything ends up being evaluated on a binary scale. And with these sort of binaries, you end up with these poles and these opposites where you've got good and bad. You've got dark, you know, you've got light and dark. You've got male and female. You've got heaven and earth. You've got clean and dirty. You've got, you see where I'm going? Like it's, and, and everything that's up here or closer to up here is better, it's closer to the good, and everything that's down here is worse, and it's closer to the bad. So um, you end up with this stretch between feminine and masculine, good and bad, light and dark, and it's a breeding ground for our thoughts on racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, elitism, all kinds of isms. <laughs> Um, that aren't serving us. There is undeniably some appeal to being able to like easily categorize things and classify things, but there's just some like denying of the spectrum and the blending and the reality and uh, so much room for oppression that happens in this. So much room for subjugation, so much room for humiliation and, and degradation that happens because of this way of thinking. Some of what we're talking about also comes from the heavily gendered language um, of, of the ancient languages that gave us the philosophies that are the, the sort of underpinnings of Western thought. So Greek and Latin are hugely gendered languages. Like if you've studied a language other than English, 
you you have probably come into the concept that that you can have nouns and and pronouns that are masculine, feminine, or neutral, but in in some of these other languages, you have verbs that fall into that category, the adjectives fall into that category, the adverbs fall into that category, like every single thing is gendered, practically. Um, and because of that, you can see why there would be this philosophy that energy, all energy is gendered. If the whole language is gendered, then then everything is gendered. Language has so much to do with how we perceive the world that that would make sense. But really, folks, so much of it just comes from the patriarchal values of the deep past and the not-so-deep past and how those values, on the one hand, raise up the feminine and put it on, and, and all that is femme, and puts it on this pedestal to be honored and worshipped, but on the other hand, degrades and humiliates the femme and the feminine that is near at hand and close to us. So there's this idealized feminine, and then there's this known feminine that is much, much less than idealized. And I would ask you to consider, why is feminine energy supposedly passive and receptive? Or is it the receptive, passive energy that's supposedly female or feminine? And why is masculinity associated with all this projectivity and activity? And I mean, honestly, it's because it all boils down to reproductive organs and ancient gender norms. And honestly, it's because it all boils down to reproductive organs and ancient gender norms. And then there are questions of which reproductive organs were you even born with and how easy, like, oh God, just so many. Which is ridiculous when you consider that A, gender, um, ideas about gender are so much more, is comprised of so much more than uh, our anatomy. That ideas of femininity and masculinity go far, far beyond our our genitalia and our chromosomes and our hormones that that it's more than that um, even our even our sex goes beyond those things and then b that gender roles vary so widely from culture to culture time to time and place to place that those things change so what's considered feminine over here is absolutely not considered feminine over there what's considered masculine over there may not be considered masculine over there. So does that mean that air is not masculine over there? And that actually, yes, in some cases it absolutely does for places that even ascribe gender to things like the elements. So revisiting some of the earlier assertions, right? Only a woman can invoke a goddess and only a man can invoke a god. Invoke who you're drawn to invoke, folks. <laughs> like, honestly. Um, you're going to have a much easier time being ridden by a spirit with whom you have an affinity. And that affinity may not have anything at all to do with your perception of what genitalia that spirit has. Like, A, you may be dead wrong about what genitalia that spirit has. Um, you, that spirit may not have any, that spirit may have all of the above, <laughs> that spirit may have something else entirely. Um, our perceptions of gender and spirit are possibly silly, um, maybe. So I'm going to share some personal experience. I am a cisgender woman, pansexual, panromantic, monogamous and married, for those of you that are super curious. And I have absolutely invoked male deity. Uh, to below, the witch father, as a matter of fact. And I didn't have any problem doing this at all. In fact, I found him easier to invoke than I found, than I have found certain other quote unquote feminine deities. 
because my relationship with him is closer. My, my understanding of him is clearer and, um, and a variety of other factors, I'm sure. But it was just a much easier experience for me than, uh, than invoking, for instance, the Morrigan. And I've witnessed the same thing from other witches and other magicians going in like every which direction that you can think of between um, how the individual magician or witch identified and how we perceive that deity or that spirit as presenting. So gay, straight, pan, bi, cis, trans, non-binary, like gender fluid, like all, every, I have witnessed literally every, well, probably not like every combination, but my goodness, I've witnessed a lot. And it really has so much more to do with the relationship that that spirit and that person have than it has to do with the body of the individual or even how they identify in terms of gender and how we perceive the gender of the deity or the spirit. So the other assumption was only a man and a woman can perform the great rite. No, just no. <laughs> uh, no. Okay, y'all, so I'm a big advocate of sacred sexuality and sex magic. And if you Google my name, Lorelei Black, you're going to undoubtedly uncover that uh, I have written several books on being a priestess of Aphrodite and that I am one of the uh, co-directors of the Babylon Rising Panthelemic Festival. In that role, um, in those roles, I should say, I've done a lot of teaching, a lot of facilitating of um, sacred sexuality and sex magic. So, and at BR, Babylon Rising, I actually um, started and have run since 2010 in some capacity or another, the Scarlet Track, which is all about sacred sex and sex magic. This makes me something of an expert. I didn't say sexpert, but I heard you say it real clear in your head. <laughs> it's okay. So let me break this down for you. If any body, regardless of sex, gender, or sexuality, is capable of invoking or being ridden by, channeling, whatever term you like, if they're capable of bringing in a spirit or deity, regardless of how we perceive that being's gender and two or more or more <laughs> of these individuals have fully invoked consensual sexual congress, however that looks like for them, then I am here to tell you that that was a great right it was a great right. <laughs> and that it was really real and it was truly true, regardless of how you, not you, because I don't think that you're that person, but regardless of how somebody else might feel about it. It's warm in here. It is like literally warm in here. And then also that was a lot of sex magic talk that popped up. Okay, and finally, to this question of, of masculine equals projective equals active and things like air and fire being masculine and the opposite of that being true, things like um, feminine energy being uh, passive and receptive and things like earth and water being those, you know, feminine energies. If what I've already said hasn't sort of swayed you out of that mindset, let me give you an alternative to consider. Um, 
in my tradition, the spiral castle tradition, which is part of American folkloric witchcraft, which you've probably heard me say before, we have elemental energies that are associated with the four cardinal directions. They're different than the four cardinal directions that are associated with the elemental energies um, in ceremonial magic and most of Wicca, but that point is less relevant for this than just the fact that we have quarters that have elements associated with them. And each of those elements has a spirit keeper. We also have four watchtowers at the cross quarters. So between each of those quarters, we envision in our cosmology um, uh, an elementally aligned watchtower. Those keepers uh, are going to be the opposite gender or a different gender, I guess, is maybe a better way of saying it, than whoever is the primary keeper at the gate. So I'll give you the example of in the south, we place earth in the south, and Goda, the white goddess, is the keeper of that gate and the, the sort of arbiter of that energy. But at the, um, but the stone castle is in the southeast and that keeper is Kernunos or the Oak King as we sometimes think of that keeper. There are a lot of different names that we associate to, to some of these different keepers, but generally uh, south we see as the white goddess earth and then southeast for that quarter uh, that cross quarter that's going to be masculine it's going to be this very oak king king of the forest kind of energy um, that stag king uh, that 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 green man kind of energy those are wildly different energies but they're both very very earth related and there's no denying um, that they're both representative of something very much related to earth and we have that all around the circle all around the compass so um, if the primary keeper is generally viewed as masculine the keeper at the cross quarter is generally viewed as feminine and vice versa all over and we're not the only ones that do something like this I've seen in other traditions uh, things like this happening where the keepers that are assigned there are um, dual and they'll have for instance in the Roebuck tradition the ancient Celtic church um, Anna and Dave Finnan's tradition out in Southern California which is an offshoot of 1734 and they studied under Evan John Jones um, with Clan of Tubal Cain so another expression of these same energies um, they've got a king and queen at each of the cardinal directions. So there's a king and queen of earth, a king and queen of air, a king and king, king and queen of water. Um, and uh, I don't remember which one I didn't say <laughs> now, so, but you get the idea. Um, so it's possible to do it in a very different way and to have um, at least the binary expressions of gender expressed and really to have room for non-binary and and fluid expressions of gender expressed if you're going to associate the elements with gender at all so there's something still of a binary present in the systems that i'm sharing with you and um, that's something of a flaw in the system. I can't speak to the Roebuck tradition that I shared because I'm, I'm not an initiate in that system, but I can tell you that within the Spiral Castle tradition, we are not necessarily attached at all to the ideas of the gods being a certain gender. Um, I have definitely interacted with, um, with gods and goddesses and, and, and deities in general who, who present 
at least in a particular time or in a particular ritual differently than lore and tradition always expresses on that. So um, these things are more of a range, more of a continuum, um, even when we are seeing them as masculine and feminine, it's, you know, masculine to neutral, feminine to neutral kind of thing. This allows us to work with, um, in the example that I gave you with uh, Goda and Kernunos or the green man, both representing earth in, in different spaces and in different aspects, this allows us to work with earth as that receptive, um, taking the seed, having that fertile womb that, that grows and nurtures life, all of these things that we associate with feminine earth, but it also allows for earth to be masculine. With our stone castle, we have, and, and the oak, uh, the oak king, we have this, you know, rock hard earth expression, this molten core with volcanic eruptions so to speak because that's a legitimate expression of earth energy as well and you could play this game with each of the quarters with each of the elements and go list you know 10 ways that air is feminine list 10 ways that water is masculine give me five gods of the water who present as masculine typically in in various cultures list three goddesses of the sun <laughs> you know tell me you know three gods of the moon they exist these things are not necessarily gender identified they just they just aren't, folks. They just aren't. <laughs> okay. It also gives us the space to lay off the gender labeling for something like Earth and to dig deeper. Pun absolutely intended. Into the magical and mystical energies of Earth. Because ultimately, we can think way past. Is Earth more boy-like or girl-like? It's neither, or maybe it's both, or all of the above. But in some ways, I think just a better question is why are we even asking <laughs> that question? Why do we need the earth to have a gender? Why do we need air to have a gender? Okay, that's all. Climbing off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I've given you something to think about and um, something to go poking around at your magic about. Um, if you're already working with uh, gender fluid or non-binary expressions of the elements um, and with magical concepts that go beyond gender norming and gender, gender stereotyping, um, if you allow for um, all types of people to be the priest or the priestess in a given ritual, you know, without assigning that as a gender role. Um, I would love to hear your experiences with that in the comments below. Or maybe you're a person who's come up against um, the difficulty of some of these really rigid gender expressions in your magical work and you have other ideas about how to navigate um, some of this stuff. Hey, go. <laughs> I would, I would love to hear from you down below. Um, if you found this information useful and helpful, or at least interesting and thought-provoking, even if you didn't agree with it, please go ahead and click that like button. Um, Bless me with that little bit of magic and love and tell your friends that there's interesting stuff happening over here at Blade and Broom. 
And if you are interested in learning more about traditional witchcraft and how to practice it, then I've got a freebie listed for you down in the description box below. There is a, a ritual guide down there called Three Rites That Every Traditional Witch Should Know. Go ahead and grab that. And uh, you might also consider looking into the Red Thread Academy of Traditional Witchcraft, which is the online witch school that I run. I would love to hear from you. That's all I have for you this week, my friends. Happy start of Pride Month, and I will... See you back here next Monday. Bye.